It was called the war to end all wars, and for good reason. Over eight and a half million people died. More than 21 million were wounded, and seven and a half million taken prisoner or missing. And perhaps the most astonishing number of all, 63 million men were mobilized to fight the war, more than half the population of America at that time. The assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire is frequently cited as being the cause of the Great War. But in reality, it's only the spark that ignites a great tinderbox that's been building in Europe for some time. Germany, France, England, Austro-Hungary, and Russia all build up their armies in anticipation of protecting, reclaiming, and even expanding their empires. The conquest of new lands and resources will ensure these nations' power in the new century. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire declares war on its neighbor, Serbia, a complex series of mutual protection treaties and royal bloodlines plunge an eager Europe in a bloody war. As the dominant Slavic power in Europe, Russia, comes to Serbia's defense, it prompts declarations of war from Germany on Russia and France. England is bound to protect France and Tsar Nicholas as a descendant of Queen Victoria. Ironically, so is Kaiser Wilhelm. And so, battle lines are drawn, pitting the central powers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany against the allied powers of France, England, and Russia. A stalemate of trench warfare begins in France at the Battle of Marne. Each side suffers an unbelievable 500,000 casualties. It's a 19th century style of battle using modern 20th century weapons. Lines of soldiers charge the enemy trenches in waves of thousands, only to meet a vicious hail of bullets from machine guns. And those who escape the guns are engulfed by clouds of poisonous gas. The loss of life is staggering, and ground gained by either side never seems to amount to more than a few miles. The carnage plays out again and again in stalemated battles at Verdun, Argonne, Somme, and Gallipoli. From America, President Wilson tries to mediate peace between the powers, but neither side shows any signs of letting up. They're not concerned with the stalemate on the muddy fields of Europe because the real lands in question are the colonial empires in Africa, Asia, and the Near East and both sides are willing to sacrifice limitless men and munitions to get them. America has no desire to involve itself in this European conflict. The nation's interests are secure. Most of its population is made up of European immigrants from one side of the conflict or another. They have no desire to see their former homelands attacked by the United States. In 1915, the Lusitania, an English ship, is torpedoed by a German U-boat, killing nearly 1,200 of its civilian passengers. Although the Germans publish ads in American newspapers warning U.S. citizens not to travel on British liners, 128 American passengers perish in the attack. The sinking of the Lusitania does bring forth some calls for action. But contrary to what most textbooks say, it does not plunge the United States into the war. To the contrary, public sentiment is such that in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson runs for re-election and wins under the slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. Some eager Americans join up with the French Foreign Legion, the British Army, or in the case of Ernest Hemingway, the Italian army as an ambulance driver. 
when British intelligence agents intercept the infamous German Zimmerman telegram promising Mexico possession of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona if they'll help fight against the United States, America wades into the fray of battle. On April 2, 1917, President Wilson stands before Congress asking for war. The right is more precious than peace, he says, and we shall fight for the things which we have carried nearest our hearts for democracy. Congress applauds his speech, and Wilson remarks, My message today was a message of death for our young men. How strange it seems to applaud that. President Wilson himself picks the first soldier from the National Lottery to be drafted to fight in Europe. Hollywood's new stars Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and Charlie Chaplin do their part to create enthusiasm for the war effort with war bond rallies. Entertainers keep the troops in good spirits. In March, before the American forces can arrive in full strength, the Germans stage a large offensive that pushes the Allied troops back some 40 miles. But they are repulsed and beaten back by an Allied counteroffensive at Soissons. The pendulum begins to swing in favor of the Allies. By September, Allied troops, including nearly 900,000 American soldiers, mass for the last major battle of the war. The British punch through the Germans' defensive Hindenburg line, and the Allies are on their way to the Kaiser's front door. The German military revolts, and chaos reigns over the country. The Kaiser is forced to abdicate. Germany indicates that it is ready to discuss the terms for peace, based on President Wilson's 14 points. On November 11th, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, Germany signs an armistice ending the war. The Treaty of Versailles conscripts Germany to pay heavy reparations totaling $32 billion and requires the country to admit guilt for causing the war. Meanwhile, the Allies divvy up her colonial possessions. All of this leaves a bitter, defeated, and economically crippled Germany with a burden that will prove too much to forgive. Over a decade later, Adolf Hitler, a former corporal of the defeated German army, would rise to power on a nationalist fervor that seems the answer to Germany's despair.